Yeah. Um, I think. All right. We are live. What is going on, guys? Sumner Healy from landinvestor.co, joined by my friend today, Kudzai. And where are you calling in from? Let's give a little bit of context before we dive into what we're going to be covering here. Where are you calling in from? Sure. I'm calling in from uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, my wife is in med school out here. So we've okay. been here for two years now. I've been all over the country. Uh, Ohio is our, our stop for now. Nice. Nice. How much longer are you going to be there for? Uh, she has two years left until uh, she's a doctor, full doctor. Um, there's a whole match process that happens yeah. after she's done with school. So it's a little up in the air on what will happen after those two years. We're just trying yeah. to make the most of it out here, you know. Do you uh, like it? I, I'm, a, I'm a big golfer. Uh, and yeah. Ohio and Cincinnati are big on golf, so it works for me. Um, pretty central as well, so flying east or west is pretty convenient for that too. Yeah. I got into I got into golf pretty deeply back in uh, April of 2022, and I haven't played recently. There's actually a lot of good golf out here in Vegas. I, you know, I was lucky if I ever broke 100, but it's a it's a great game. Um, I will say, like the first six months to a year is just a lot of suck. Like it's yeah. pretty pretty miserable. You go out with your friend. All my friends are really good, and they would they would smoke me out there. Um, but I love it. Like being in the sun, being outdoors for six hours, freaking epic. This is not a podcast about golf, though. What we're talking about today here, we're going to be diving into a, a whole smorgasbord of different things. We're going to be talking about uh, tax auction strategies. This is going to be an interesting call because there's very few people in the land investing world that are doing tax auctions at scale, and you've had some pretty wild success there. Uh, we're going to be talking about a really cool uh, product slash I'm really more, I guess, on the service side that you guys are putting together for land investors to get boots on the ground, eyeballs on deals before we buy them. You know, really like, whether you're doing tax auctions, direct mail, cold texting, one of the things that we face is, and it's a it's a pro and it's a con, but we buy most of our deals sight unseen, right? And that's beautiful because we can do this business from anywhere in the world and we can buy land anywhere in the US. That also can mean that we buy deals that have things that we never expected, right? Weird topography, drunk junk on them. Um, I've had you know tweakers living on properties. I've had mountains of junk. Uh, you name it, I've seen it. And so being able to get eyes on the properties is going to be... It's going to be a huge service because for most folks in the land business right now, it's go pay $500 or $600 for a drone photographer. So we're going to dive into that. Um, one of the things that we were talking about before this call that I thought, you know what, we should probably share this on here. So we're recording this on Thursday, the 16th. I'm going out to the Philippines this Saturday to go visit uh, and meet my team, uh, which is super exciting, flying into Manila. And so we were kind of talking about like, hey, how is your team structured? Who are you actually meeting in the Philippines? Um, so I'm going to go over that here. So the team right now is it sits, it's the Philippines, it's uh, Pakistan, and it's here in the U.S. and Texas. Um, so in the Philippines, we've actually had some people leave our team in January. So our team's kind of been, we had two people leave in January. It's kind of changed a little bit. But our disp dispositions manager, Karen, is in the Philippines. Um, all right, I misspoke too. We also have someone in, in uh, Mexico City. Disposition manager, Karen, is in the Philippines. She's in Manila probably the first person that we see. Aries, who runs our cold texting department, he's in the Philippines as well. Uh, Martin, our video editor, is in the Philippines as well. Sam, our website guy, is in the Philippines. Um, and I think that's it. So we had uh, all of our acquisition team over there previously. We've actually migrated that to here in the US and in, in Mexico City, actually. Um, so yeah, super excited. I've got a deep love for, for that country. Like I just, you know, I've spent at this point, six years working with people from the Philippines, both wow. in my land business and my previous career, they had this huge office in the Philippines that they had created and they had about a hundred quote unquote virtual assistants um, in there. So that's something that we may be talking about later, something that I'm interested in. Um, but dude, let's talk about tax auction, man. Let's, let's talk about how the heck you even got into this weird world of land investing. What was the catalyst for you? Yeah, I just, you know, I like to start off by applauding you. You know, I think anytime someone is able to, build and maintain a team i think that that speaks volumes about your ability to manage and organize information and people so you know appreciate that man good on you <laughs> thank you man it's, it's definitely it's been a very iterative process like, you know, yeah. i get humbled often but probably one of the most rewarding things i've ever done in my life to be honest like that's awesome nice. building and creating things is dope like if you're entrepreneurial that is one of the greatest satisfactions in life is building something creating some, taking a thought and creating that into the physical world and like oh, yeah. they've seen that, you know, come to life. And then doing that with a team is like, oh my God, one of the greatest yeah. feelings ever. So thank you, man. Um, yeah, let's talk about the, the catalyst into, into lands. What, what was the story there? Yeah, I've been involved in real estate now for, I mean, since I was in college. 
And part of the challenge that I found, um, I didn't talk about this when we were on the call a few weeks ago, uh, but I came to the U.S. as an F1 student, uh, which meant that, you know, I had very limited options for how I could make money. And, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in the, in the kind of statement that uh, necessity is the mother of invention, right? Yeah. If you don't have a way to make money, you're going to find a way to make money because bills have got to be paid and, and you want to buy stuff. And, you know, there are just needs that need to be met. So, you know, I got creative. My first business idea is like a freshman, sophomore was, you know, writing business. And I would help students that had English as a second language kind of figure their thing out. And I would make money that way. Um, but I got interested in real estate kind of through bigger pockets initially. Uh, I did some research and reading on the subject. And I didn't have a, a whole lot of capital available yeah. to me, you know, 19, 20 years old, um, no job or anything like that. And so I started to look at ways that I could get creative with the little capital that I did have, uh, trying to look at ways that I could deploy it and, you know, multiply it and, and then redeploy it and just grow it. And one of the options that I came across was owner financing for property. So kind of a little tangential to tax sales. Um, but I, I bought a few owner uh, finance properties out in Pennsylvania and, you know, did some rehab and rented those out. Um, but I think through that experience, I, I worked through some challenges, um, kind of the challenges of um, out of state uh, landlordship, dealing with tenants that, you know, you never see. Um, dealing with property managers that you've met, you know, once or twice. And I think part of the reason that I really respect the fact that you've built and maintained a team at distance is it can be tough sometimes to maintain that communication, maintain that mutual respect when you're not seeing each other physically um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And so after some tough experiences uh, with rental properties, I took a step back um, and kind of reassessed uh, what made sense for me at that point in time. Uh, and so I came across kind of some ads on YouTube for, for tax sales and, you know, land investing and this and that. And usually, you know, um, I, I would click past that kind of thing. Yep. Um, but I engaged with, with one of these ads and kind of dived down the YouTube rabbit hole of all the courses and podcasts and really started to consume a lot of that information. Um, and I think what interested me most about tax sales uh, and land investing is that it it felt like such a niche in the real estate industry. Um, you know, there's bird there. There are a bunch of different methods that have kind of grown in popularity when it comes to real estate investing. And I didn't see that same level of interest on the land investing and especially on the tax investing front. So this was kind of new frontier opportunity to own land um, and really learn about a new industry. So, you know, I spent a few months learning and, and just trying to understand the industry, doing a lot of reading, a lot of research, um, and, you know, kind of got to this point where I'm at now where I've learned through experience and I'm really enjoying the process. Dude, that's a, that's a lot of parallels between our story, which is actually yeah. interesting. I was a, a similar story in the sense that bigger pockets was like what woke me up to, oh my God, like owning assets, that's the jam. Um, got super into the burr stuff. I had no money. I was like 18 or 17 at the time. And I listened to bigger pockets religiously for years. And must have been like 23 or 24. And I heard a podcast with Jack Bosch on bigger pockets talking about land investing. And it wasn't like the, the competition aspect you mentioned is interesting. For me, it was the low barrier to entry. I'm like, okay, I've got like seven grand in the bank. Like, like it sounds like I could get started with this avenue. Uh, and it seemed more like a business to me. Like I've always, I've always been more into business than investing per se. And so like the burst stuff, it's, well, I can make 200 bucks a month in cash flow. I'm like, I need a lot of rentals. Why you start a business and make like 20, 30 grand a month, like in the next year. So that was always a little more enticing. Some of like the more active income stuff, especially at that age. Um, what I did though, and I, I did have like, once I got into the game and I did a few deals, I saw how lucrative it was. I started to get this irrational fear of competition, oh, which I pretty much totally dropped out at this point. I don't really like, I just don't really stress it out or think about it much. But back then it was bad. And what I would do is I would go and look at all of the YouTube videos for land investing, the Facebook group for land investing, and see how many more views they were getting every week, how much they were growing, comparing them to other real estate Facebook groups and videos, just to be like, okay, I have something relative for a comparison. I'm like, this is still underground. This is still super niche. Right. Uh, and it's grown since then, but this is still very, very niche, right? 
let's talk about, and I, I'm actually, before we move into the next question, when you had those properties in Pennsylvania, I've never, I, I've been, I've had one rental property, totally accidental and it worked out okay. It was in yeah. Texas. Um, it was a land deal that had like a structure on it that I rented out. But being an out-of-state landlord with those deals in Pennsylvania that were owner finance, what were you making from a cash flow perspective and how much time was it taking like monthly uh, from you? Well, I'll just respond to something that you said previously, yeah. right? Just this fear of competition. You know, I feel like it's not unique to the immigrant ex experience, but for me, that's where I came from was coming from a country where, you know, there's opportunity, but it's not like it is here in the U.S. And it's yeah. very easy for you know, for things to just go like that. And so I always kind of had that mentality as well, you know, a kind of mindset of uh, not of abundance, right, of just competition and fear. And I, I, I'm on the same page as you that you have to have, uh, you have to be part of that culture of abundance that there is more out there that, you know, and you're doing it, you're sharing information because you're not afraid of the fact that competition is going to come and drive your business to zero. Competition yeah. is only going to, you know, make this industry more and more uh, better for, for everybody, sure. I think, you know. So I'm on the same boat with you. Um, as far as Pennsylvania is concerned, you know, I think the the phrase passive investment or passive <laughs> income, there's no such thing. Yeah. You know, if, if you stop paying attention to uh, emails from your property manager and stop responding and everything takes time and effort. And I'm a big believer in, you know, the more that you put in, the more that you get out. Obviously, we want to leverage our time and, and utilize um, tools and skills and, and other people so that we can uh, multiply our effort. Uh, but with Pennsylvania, what I found was that, you know, I had a property manager out there um, and he he managed all three properties for me and he was OK in the beginning. But the challenge that I found was he was trying to grow his business as well. So he had some kind of handyman stuff that he was doing. He had some property um, remodeling, renovation stuff that he was doing. And so I was competing for his time and the quality of service just, I mean, it, it plummeted over time uh, yeah. to the point where, you know, I was considering making the six hour drive out to Pittsburgh <laughs> where these properties were located and just handling things myself. Um, before I talk about the cash flow, you know, I'll, I'll just talk about some of the mistakes that I made as an investor in those properties um, I, I firmly believe that everyone deserves grace, you know, everyone that we deal with, whether in business or in personal life, because you don't know what people are dealing with. And, you know, I'm only here because of someone else's grace. Someone else has let me off the hook. They've given me a chance with a deal that has allowed me to get, achieve the success that I've achieved. So it, it's only right that I pass that on. The mistake that I made with my tenants in Pennsylvania was taking that to the extreme and, kind of, you know, listening to the sob stories and and trying to work out plans for people over and over again. And what I found was that, you know, you give someone an opportunity to uh, kind of get one over on you a few too many times and, and there's just a lack of respect. You just lose it. From a cash flow perspective, you know, I was netting, you know, three, four hundred dollars per property. Okay. So they weren't they weren't losers, but you know, they I was not going to retire anytime soon from those yeah. investments. Yeah. And, and, and so I think that also drove me to look at alternate areas. Um, real estate investing and in property um, is, is a challenge because you have doors, you have tenants, you have grass, you have maintenance. There's just a lot that has to happen. Whereas land investing, there's dirt, you know, you deal with the county, you deal with the city. Um, but there's a lot less headache, I think, uh, when yeah. it comes to land investing. Um, so big proponent of that. Uh, I, I still, you know, plan to hold on to uh, rental property in the future. Uh, but right now my focus is land. Yeah. Yeah, man. It, the, the grace aspect is, is funny. Um, we, I, we've seen that a lot with our owner finance portfolio. Like when we first got started doing really low dollar properties and you deal with a certain kind of customer, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to put it that way. So right. Very interesting people. And I... I have a bit of a bleeding heart when it comes to this stuff and like the sob stories and the thing. I grew up with a single mom and I'd hear the single mom story and all that stuff. And finally my team sat me down. They're like, dude, this is effing insane. We have like 60 different arrangements with people of when they're going to pay us. And they're like giving us coupon, like just weird. <laughs> like it's got out of hand. They're like, this is a business, right? Like there has to be some boundaries that, uh, so I definitely relate to that for sure. I think too, 
the way, and this is not like a new idea by any means, but I've been really keen on active income. So building businesses like the land business and pouring that income into assets. Right. Right. But I've been so scared to do it with small deals, like single family deals, all that stuff. But it's a bit of a conundrum because it's like, well, I want, you know, economies of scale, kind of vertical integration, integration, go really big. But that's also effing terrifying. So my first deal is like a you know, five or $10 million property. And I'm stuck in this like no action zone where I'm like, it's not worth my time to do that single family deal. I'm scared to do a giant deal. So I don't really know what the in-between stage is for me. Um, but I'm really keen on this stuff. I mean, I think it like, you know, building a business is amazing, especially a business like the land business, because it's just a cash flow machine. Right. But I think to have like, if, if wealth is the goal, and wealth looks a little bit different for every person, right? For wealth, so for some people, is just reliable cash flow. I think cash flow creates a really nice lifestyle. But I think in most in most scenarios, we're talking about really creating big wealth. It comes from like a liquidity event. The right. trouble with the land business is you're not building up an asset that you can ever sell. There's just no like real intrinsic value to the land business. Um, and so like, you can take the cash flow from it, stuff it into an asset, 60 years, sell it or, or hold it for generations and your family can live off of it. So definitely interested in that. Less, and three hundred four dollars a month is actually better than I expected. Um, that's not too shabby, but oh, yeah. it probably was a lot of work too. You and know, so much, no, no profit, maybe. No, and and you know what was interesting about? <laughs> I feel like I'm a very scrappy kind of investor and businessman, yeah. right? Uh, I mean, there were there were nights where my wife, who was my fiance girlfriend at the time, you know, she would see me on calls with these tenants, and they're just telling me all kinds of stories and. There was one day where I just, you know, I was trying to figure out how I would pay bills. People hadn't paid for months. And I just laid down on the couch and I stared at the ceiling and I had no idea what to do. I was just stressed out of my mind. But I really feel like entrepreneurs, you know, you figure out a way. You always have to figure out a way. There, there's not an option to stop. So, um, you know, when it comes to investing in, in, in uh, real estate and in, um, property. I think that's definitely something that I'm going to pursue. And um, just in response to your point about inaction, I think that's where I was for a long time when it came to land investing. And I might have uh, overextended the period of education uh, and, and not uh, dived into action quickly enough. Yeah. One of the areas that I haven't uh, pursued, I think, as much as I want to have is uh, is the mailers. I've only sent out you know two or three batches of mailers at this point. Yep. And um, I think that, like you said, it's a really lucrative part of the business. Um, so, you know, just start, I would say start small, you know, reduce your margin of error and just learn by experience is, is my advice. Yeah, I need, to, I need to take the advice that I tell everyone in the lead program. It's like the first deal is not to make you rich. Maybe you don't even make any money. The first, it's just like getting over that first deal hump. Right. I've got this idea that my first rental property is going to be like this slam dunk. It's like, just get the dang thing over with, dude, and yeah. just move on, right? Um, so, yeah, I, and it's funny. I, I have such a bias towards action everywhere else, but I notice I'm a really crappy investor. Like, I'm a good business owner. I'm a crappy investor. So, I just kind of, like, I just freeze. I'm like, I don't know. This is out of my element. So, I need to remedy that. I I like what you said about, uh, and we're going so off topic, but that's the be beauty of this. We can do whatever the heck we want here. Yeah. <laughs> I love the idea of, what is an entrepreneur? It, to me, at the core of it, it's not an inventor. It's not like this, you know, whiz kid that comes up with these brilliant ideas. It's just someone that's really resourceful at the end of the day. Oh, yeah. The thing is, that's innate to all humans. And some of us have lost touch with that. But at the core, being an entrepreneur is just being resourceful. I think that's such a beautiful skill to develop for, for everyone, right? Yeah. Uh, you see that a lot with immigrants. That's why, like, they, they come and just freaking kick ass uh, relative to some of the lazier folks in this country. But let, let's talk about your best deal to date. Like, and it doesn't have to be what net you the most, just the most exciting deal, cool story, anything along those lines. I think my best deal to date um, was a lot that I purchased in the, the last Michigan auction that I participated in. Yeah. You know, uh, It's actually funny how I, I, how I bought those uh, properties. It ended up being a, a, a lot of 35 different properties that I bought at you know one moment in time. Um, I was on the golf course when the auction was happening, just as, as a function of bad timing and a re reflection of how much I play golf that I was on the <laughs> behind the laptop doing a deal. Um, and, you know, there was 15 minutes left in the auction playing uh, 15, 15th hole or something like that, 14th hole. And I had to jump on my phone because I didn't want to miss out on this auction. 
So between shots, I would check, you know, what's the current asking price? What's the current high bid? What do I need to bid to win this thing? Uh, and it got down to the last like five or 10 seconds. You know, I pressed submit on my highest offer, beat out the guy right before me. And, you know, there you go. I bought my first, uh, I made my first land investment, $6,000, um, you know, beat out probably some, some investor that had a lot more money than I had, but I just, you know, submitted my highest bid, um, at, at the right time. Uh, so that was very exciting, you know, 35 deals, six grand. That's pretty insane. Well, talk to us about the outcome, right? So you buy a slow golf course. Are you like, what do you, did you even know what to do next once you bought them? Or is it just like, I'm gonna figure it out the fly. You know what? I, I feel like, um, I have a bias sometimes towards inaction as well. And I will just over consume information and just yeah. have information overload. And so I, but, but sometimes it helps, right? Because I prepare for every scenario as, as much as I'm able to, um, we good. Yeah. We're good. I don't know. I just <laughs> disappeared for a second. Yeah. No worries. So I, I feel like I prepare for every scenario as much as I can. Right. I, I sometimes over prepare, but the beauty of that is when you're faced with unexpected situations, you're kind of more comfortable. So, you know, I won the um, auction. Uh, there was nothing immediate that needed to happen right after. Um, but then, you know, obviously in the days after you have to submit uh, full payment for the properties, I had to submit a premium, um, obviously submitted a deposit. And then we kind of stepped into the process of transferring ownership of the properties from the county to myself. So, you know, 35 different properties, three pages of, of affidavits, two pages of uh, transfer documents. It was a lot of paperwork to work through, uh, a lot of signatures uh, with the notary and, you know, a lot of learning on the fly as well, as much as I had prepared there was just a lot that I had to learn kind of in the moment. Um, but, you know, the reason that I, I tried to fight against my bias uh, to inaction is even when you're in the midst of a new situation and, and there's money involved, um, I feel like we have a great ecosystem in the real estate investment world, especially in land investing. And the folks that I've dealt with to date have been nothing but helpful you know, at the county level, at the municipal level, people are willing to explain things. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm embarrassed to admit this now. Uh, well, I'm less embarrassed to admit this now that I know what it means. But when I did that deal, I had no idea what the acronym PA stood for. I didn't know that was a purchase agreement. And I had to ask my, uh, my title agent about that. And she, she taught me that and so much more and worked with me through each deal, helped me to make uh the following each deal more profitable than the last one. So I really leaned on kind of the folks that I worked with. Um, and we're still working through uh, some of the leftover properties from, from uh, that transaction. So it was definitely very exciting. So 35 properties, when did you buy this too? Was this, this was fall of last year? Yeah, this was October of last year. October of last year. So we're currently March 16th. How many of those 35 lots have sold so far? We've sold 30 of 35. Oh, wow. uh, yeah. So we have five remaining that we actually didn't list back then just because they are little kind of junk properties. Um, now we're just trying to offload them, probably just quick claim them to the adjacent property owners. Um, but really, when, when I bought those properties as well, there were maybe five or 10 properties that I had identified as kind of the, the meaty properties where I was going to make my money back. And... The other properties were kind of supplemental. You know, I thought I might be able to do something with them. Uh, but what's ended up happening is, you know, we've been able to, um, again, because of my team and, and them knowing how we can best market these properties, we've been able to turn a profit on every single one wow. and, you know, just have it have it work out in, in everyone's favor. Wow. Dude, yeah. so on the, on the disposition side, were you just quit claiming these deeds to people? Were you quieting the title? What was the playbook there? Yeah. I mean, you're going to hear this from me, the whole interview, my team, my team, my team. <laughs> um, so we gave our buyers two options. They could either uh, do a quit claim or they could do a warranty deed. Um, I worked with a title company that uh, specialized in doing land deals, right? And they, they have a relationship with the county. They have a relationship with the different cities that I bought properties in. So they were able to figure some stuff, some things out for me. 
um, for the buyers that chose the warranty deed uh, in Michigan, there's a process called FOIA, which is not particular to Michigan. It's just the Freedom of Information Act. And that's the process by which a title company will look at uh, a property's chain of title to make sure that there's no break in that chain, that title is clean, and that they can issue a title insurance policy for a property. Um, so when I gave buyers the option, it was, yes, we can do a warranty deed for you with two caveats. One, your close is going to be, you know, it's going to take uh, potentially a month to a month and a half just because this takes a while. Yeah. Two, there's an additional cost, right? It's $600 to do that kind of research. Um, what I found was that most buyers opted to do a warranty deed as opposed to a quick claim. Uh, but we did have a few buyers for whom, you know, time was of the essence and, and we just quick claimed it over. They saved their money and we closed quickly. Did you, for the quick claim folks, did you give them a discount? Well, they just weren't charged the $600 for the Got FOIA. It. Yeah. And we're able to close faster. But yeah, not, not a price difference, which, which is interesting. Um, I don't know why I've always had this like a rational fear of quick claim deeds and like no one would ever buy a deal on a quick claim deed. Uh, yeah. Just because that's kind of what I heard when I got started. I've never kind of gone down that rabbit hole. Just re what was the take rate on quick claim deed versus going the FOIA route? You know, if I was on the other side, especially yeah. with a property that was purchased at tax sale auction, I would opt for the quick claim deed because yeah. when a property is purchased by the county, right? Part of the beauty of tax sale investing is if there's a lien, if there's a mortgage on the property, if there's any kind of debt that's attached to the property, I mean, I'm talking weed cutting fees. I'm talking invoices for late water payments for missed sewage payments. It's like, you know, you're a baby again, you're, you've done nothing wrong. Yeah. It's all wiped clean. And so this was another area of great learning for me with my title company was, Hey, you know, if you don't call the, the city and tell them that you bought these at tax sale, at closing, you will be charged for all this stuff that you can get uh, waived. And wow. so, you know, with that little piece of advice, we're able to save, you know, sometimes three, four thousand dollars on fees that they just wiped into thin air. Um, wow. Yeah. Wow. Dude. Yeah. I didn't even factor that in. That's really interesting. Okay. So there's, yeah. there's definitely an advantage to go the quick claim route. Um, yeah. For moving these properties, this is your first time selling land. You bought 35 properties in one go, which is it was a big way to get started. Was this all moved through realtors? Did you do any of the selling on your own? What did that look like? Yeah, and I think this is an area where I'm still learning. And now I'm actually looking forward to uh, getting involved in your course. I'm, I'm looking to dive into it sometime soon and, and just explore what it means to do more of this work myself. Um, I listed the first few properties on my own on Zillow and I would take calls and kind of handle uh, the work that an agent would initially. But I quickly got overwhelmed <laughs> with the number of responses that I was getting from folks and just keeping things organized and being able to focus on doing the next deal. And so I'm still trying to find kind of my happy medium where I can be a businessman and kind of scale my business and build systems. Um, and then kind of where I identify responsibilities that I can pass off onto an agent or, you know, uh, someone that works as a virtual assistant. So I actually ended up listing all the properties with my agent um, after that initial flood of phone calls. And we worked great together. Um, she, of course, took her cut. Um, but I think for the value that she brought and especially being on the ground and being able to kind of... Uh, take pictures and give me a sense of the neighborhoods and what I should really be asking for some of these properties. She, she earned her, um, her pay on these, on these deals. Yeah. 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 A good realtor will drive so much value. Like they're hard to find, but if you do find one, you struck gold. Right. Yeah. I think too, something I often think about <laughs> a lot actually is, do I just get rid of my whole entire disposition process and just use realtors? And it's tough because I love my dispositions team and, I mean, they do such a good job and I'm a bit of a control freak when it comes to like customer experience. I think that stuff right. really matters. And I, I don't know. I don't know if you're like a Seth Godin fan, but I don't even know if this is in the exact verbiage he would use, but you know, like you can, uh, business is a cool way because you're transacting with someone, right? I'm giving you something of value. You give me something of value, AKA cash typically. Um, and in that process, like 
you are interfacing with a with a stranger and you could you could give them joy or you could make them begrudged and hate the experience and we work with some businesses we're like god this is horrible i uh, like going the route of like you can sprinkle in joy and some of that's just from humor some of that's from speed of response some of that's just from the level of care the authenticity i just don't feel like i have that same control with realtors but what i will say is that there's a difference between a contractor and an employee Right. Having an employee is a totally different can of worms than having a realtor who's like a contractor in your business, right? And sometimes I do wish, I'm like, I wish my team was smaller because it's just, oh, there's a lot that goes on. Everyone's got things happening all the time. Um, we just had a guy inside our Leo program who's been with us for, for two years, runs a super big land business, and he's just transitioned everything over to realtors. And what's cool about that is like really savvy land realtors, they have access to all the same marketing and listing tools that we have. And so immediately... We could take out you know four thousand or five thousand dollars a month that we pay out to these listing platforms, remove the cost of our team and the headache, and go with the realtor route. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's pros and cons to both. If you're doing volume at the end of the day, you do end up paying a ton. So for the realtor that you had, what was the agreement you structured? Was it five points? Was it more than that? Oh man, you want me to say the number? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> was it ten? No, it wasn't ten. Um, so it was it was five to represent me. Okay. Um, and then, you know, she, she, there were a few deals where the buyer would ask for representation and then she, you know, charged them 3%. Um, okay. but I think part of the reason that we ne negotiated for a higher rate than just a typical, uh, 3% was because some of these lots were lower dollar value than she would typically take on. Yep. And I, I guess part of the reason that I valued her so much was even on a small, you know, one, two, three thousand dollar deal. I mean, she would be up at like 2, 3 a.m. texting me updates on the property and just working hard on this stuff. And, and so I appreciated that. And I was just curious, you know, for you when you started out in the, in the business, were you leaning more towards uh, kind of having things handled by a realtor or did you handle yeah. everything in-house? Yeah, I, so I, I did everything in-house. And I honestly, like your story about not knowing what a PA was, cracked me up because I didn't even know what a warranty deed was. And when I okay. had to call the county in Crump, Nye County right here by, by Vegas. And there's a sweet old lady that worked there and she, they're not allowed to give legal advice, but she definitely gave me legal advice <laughs> to show me how to structure a deed. Um, and so I mean, honestly, like at the time, I just didn't know better. I, I didn't think a realtor would take on my little rinky dink. And they probably wouldn't have in most cases, $2,000 lot. And so yeah. I was doing self closings. I was just putting them on Facebook marketplace and talking to folks um, and so some of it was just from ignorance, but I will say from like a, a business owner perspective, I do think I have a bit of a, a, like a, a tendency around control, uh, for, for better, or for worse. And in the few realtor experiences that I've had, it is like, I have no control over the process. So I don't get a response from them for days and that, that just drives me nuts. So I did everything solo when I first started, we've had, if there, I think there's certain properties that lend to having a realtor, like, and if we put ourselves in the shoes of a buyer, being able to have someone walk the property or sometimes even get, show you how to get to the property. Some of these properties are really hard to get to that are super rural. Um, and that, you know, having like the legitimacy of a realtor can go a long way for, for buyers. So there's some properties where it's warranted a buyer or a realtor rather. Uh, but about 95% of what we sell now is all in-house. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. It, it, yeah. There's definitely merits to it. I mean, one, like the, the cost to get a deal done is way lower. It also allows us the, one of the tricky things with realtors is doing small dollar deals, which you were able to find someone. But in a lot of cases, if you don't have a portfolio of deals, most of them aren't interested. Or if they are interested, it's almost a bit of a red flag. It's like, why do you want this deal that you're going to make a $100 commission on? Um, and we have had some some funny experiences with that in the past. Um, and then the owner financing side of things, that can get a little bit tricky with realtors uh, and just kind of eat into the down payment. And it, it just does, it kind of ruins the numbers in a lot of cases. So. Right now, yeah, it's everything's in house. So, talk to me about the the thirty five deals that you got. It's a heck of a start. Do you think you just caught lightning in a bottle? Is this something that's repeatable? Like, are you doing this again? Do you think people are watching this call have the same opportunity, or was that just like fluke, amazing circumstances? You know what? Again, focusing on that culture of abundance, right? In the U.S., we have three thousand ninety two counties, something like that, <laughs> across fifty states. There's plenty of opportunity to find auctions all year long. You could. You could attend a tax sale auction every day of the year if you wanted to. Um, when it comes to that deal, there are some counties that will sell their properties bundled up, um, as happened in Michigan. 
right? They'll have six or seven properties as part of a single lot. And with that kind of structure, you know, you can quickly see how the numbers balloon. You win two, three, four lots, right? You're at 24, uh, 25, 26, 27, up to 35 properties very easily. Um, it's highly dependent on the county, right? And I was talking about, you know, 3,000 counties in the U.S. Only about half of those are tax deed counties. So that, that drops the number of opportunities down a little bit. Um, and then within that, you have some that are hybrid deed and lien states. So you'll, oh, really? you'll, yeah, you'll buy the property uh, on the day of the auction, but you're not going to get the deed right away. There's still a waiting period. So you really, I feel like the, the resources are there online. Uh, yep. to find this opportunity and, and to have it happen again and again and again. Um, but, you know, it requires time to, to research kind of what makes sense for you and how to prepare for that kind of kind of opportunity. So for the folks watching this video, they're saying, you know, I'm priced out of direct mail or I'm already doing direct mail and want to add another acquisitions channel. Do you just start Googling like, hey, what's the what's the most of the upcoming tax auction? Should you start with markets that you already like and then just try to kind of reverse engineer from from there and figure out when the tax auction is? What's the what's the game plan? So I think first step as with, I think, anything else in real estate and investing in general, you want to start with what you know, right? And I feel like local is is the best way to go when it comes to real estate investing because you can be on the ground. You can understand what the situation is. You know, ideally, if it's a place that you've been in for a number of years, you know what the different neighborhoods are about, you know, what value you can achieve in one neighborhood that you can't in another, you know what's overpriced. But for a lot of folks, that's not an option, right? You might live in, in Brooklyn. You might live in uh, Austin, Texas, where it just doesn't make financial sense for you, especially if, you know, you're just starting out and you're not looking to risk significant uh, capital. So that's when you go a little further afield. And I would say the first step at that point is uh, figure out what the tax deed states are, right? There are 25, 26 tax deed states in the United, United States. Um, from that list, right, um, you can find uh, a lot of websites with text lists of the counties and uh, all the counties in the U.S. Um, so you filter that county list down to include just uh, the states that have uh, tax deed sales. So now you're down to 1,500 counties. From there, it's it can be a little arduous, right, to, to figure out, you know, what date uh, is an auction happening in every single one of these 1,500 counties. But the beauty of all those opportunities is that you don't have to attend every single auction to be profitable in a year, to make great money. Um, you might only need to participate in a handful of auctions, and, and that's, that's your work for the year. So I would say don't go crazy with trying to figure out when every single auction is happening because you will, uh, you will paralyze yourself with analysis, analysis paralysis, right? Just find a list of five or ten auctions happening within the next four to eight, maybe 12 weeks. And then spend that time between now and the auction doing your due diligence, right? Research the properties that are going to be part of that auction. Understand what properties uh, could have value, what properties are junk properties, what properties are adjacent to, um, to you know, a garbage dump or to a neighborhood that no one is going to want to build in. Right. Part of what we're doing in this land investment business is identifying uh, gaps in, in value, right? Where one party doesn't recognize value. You come in, you recognize what a property is worth, you buy it at a discount and you sell it to your end buyer at a discount as well. So, you know, everyone is doing well. Um, so after you do your due diligence, you understand kind of where you want to focus on, what properties within those auctions will drive value for you, what's affordable for you in those auctions. The next step is really to set your parameters for uh, when you participate in those auctions. And what I found really helped me is understanding before, before I step into the casino, you're in Vegas, right? Before I step into the casino, what amount of money am I willing to lose uh, before I call it a night? And that really helped to drive a lot of strategy for me when it came to bidding. Because, you know, if, if I find a property that I fall in love with, 
if the bidding goes too high, I'm going to walk away from that property because yeah. I will either burn myself or I will be out of my depth and I won't know how to um, close that deal um, on the disposition side. So I come into an auction with a strategy. I, I know how much I'm going to bid for each property. I know what value um, I can get for each property. And typically, I'm looking at velocity of capital um, when it comes to investing. Right? I want to buy at a discount, but I also want to sell at a discount so that I don't have my capital tied up for a month or two months or three months. So you know, if a property is worth $100,000, can I sell it at 70% for a profit? and be satisfied. And if not, you know, then I either need to bid lower or I need to not look at that property. Yep. Um, yeah. So there are a ton of resources out there. Um, and, you know, I'm sure you have some as well. Um, what I found is that there's significant overlap in the land investment um, and tax sale um, kind of ecosystems, right? You find a lot of information that's applicable uh, to one another in both. So, Look online, look at podcasts, look at YouTube. Um, there are a handful of podcasts that I think are great for, for this kind of thing. Um, online courses. Like I said, I'm going to jump into your course to learn more about land investing specifically. Um, yeah. But, you know, just be hungry for the information at the end of the day as well, I think. I have been sincerely interested in learning about this thing and about this arcane little industry that no one really cares about is yeah. you know tax no one wants to talk about tax for fun um but you know once you dive into it and if you find a passion for it like i'm sure you have for land you know the learning comes easy yeah for sure yeah. dude a lot a lot to unpack there i think first and foremost for the folks that are listening sounds like less is more right i mean there's a, oh, yeah. a cabillion different tax auctions you can go and find just hone in on a few aggregate a list of them monitor them. And I've always had this, this is one of the things that's kind of kept me out of tax auctions. And I've looked at some, some tax auctions and I'm like, it seems like the, with some properties, there's just like this hyper mania where it, the price gets bid up maybe even higher than retail. And so I think it's wise to, to really stick to your guns in terms of like, this is what I'm outlaying for this and, and nothing more. I always tell people too, like inside the program, we never know what we're going to sell these properties for. We don't like yeah. we, we, we try to come up with the best guess and a lot of really what we're doing is trying to minimize risk right and try to understand what's our contingency plan like what if things really do hit the fan and this doesn't work out what's my exit do i have enough of a buffer there to get out of this thing and, and, and not lose too much skin when i'm underwriting deals that's that is the first thing i'm looking at. it's not how much am i going to make it's like you know, what's what's kind of like my, my buffer here similar thing to the tax auctions right like allocating a set budget and then just knowing when you're out of your element and, and saying i'm not going to participate for now yeah. Um, that's one of the cool things too. And one of the reasons I love new land investors to use joint venture partners for funding deals is like a JV partner, they're focused because their whole business is putting capital out, getting capital back in. They are such sticklers on velocity of capital because that is what drives their returns. I think as land investors, some folks can get caught up in maximizing value. And it's like the best land investors play the game of velocity of capital right. at the core. Like we'll sacrifice return for getting more deals done and moving them quicker and a jv partner will force that upon you because some new land investors they see get stars in their eyes like well i could sell this for four times what it's worth it's like well it's gonna take you about a year and a half so, so it's better they just recycle that capital um dude i think something that's kind of interesting that we could do here on this call i think it'd be a value for for the other folks we could do like a kind of a mini quasi coaching session for maybe questions that you have outside of the tax stuff more related to, to building a land investing business is there anything okay. that comes to mind that you want to work through here Oh, I get a free coaching <laughs> session. This is yeah, uh, yeah, let's do it, man. <laughs> I got a list right here. Hold on. Let me open it up. <laughs> okay. Perfect. You're prepared. No, you know what? Um, I've really been interested. I mean, you talked about this the last time that we spoke. And, and again, yeah. this time is how you're able to manage the full kind of deal cycle, right? From beginning to end. And I've had some personal experience with preparing and getting a deed recorded uh, but really beyond that, you know, all I've done is, is buy and sell and, and list on Zillow, right? I haven't really gotten involved in making the sausage of, of finishing a deal. So I'd be interested to learn from you kind of what's involved in that. I mean, you've talked about underwriting, you've, you've talked about kind of your involvement with the deeds and, um, and all that. Yeah. I'll talk about the, the process in entirety, uh, like what we do A to Z. 
I think first and foremost, when we look at the land business, we got to break it up into three different verticals, right? So it's actually pretty damn simple. We've got acquisitions, operations, and dispositions. So theoretically, you need to build teams around that. Usually how we structure that team is the first hire in someone's business is going to be what we call a general SVA. They'll be like a mini kind of COO operator doing a lot of like just the minutia day to day. When we get a deal done, there's like 30 to 50 steps that need to get done. And so they're kind of helping assist, make sure that that ball is always in motion. The next hire would be on the acquisition side and then building out a dispositions team. If that's the route someone wants to go, it just really depends on like how much volume they're doing, what kind of properties they're going after. Um, now, for some of those areas, you can plug in what I call like contractors. So I consider like a title company, a contractor. I consider a realtor, a contractor. They can kind of plug in some of those gaps. So back in the day, we used to do all self-closings. And I'm like, well, now I'm in the business of being a title abstractor. And I'm not really a land investor. So I think there's some things like just from the jump, we want to sub out. So <laughs> title would be one of those. Like I just would never recommend anyone go down the rabbit hole of self-closings. Oh, maybe. maybe. Yeah, maybe on the disposition side. But for most people, the 1200 bucks you pay to a title company, one, it's kind of title companies are funny because they're literally creating an insurance policy on the work that they were supposed to do for you, which is kind of <laughs> ironic. It's like, yeah, we think we did it right, but here's an insurance policy to insure you. Um, so you're paying for the insurance policy. That's awesome. You're paying for escrow, which is amazing. That protects you and the buyer. I've had some horror stories of self-closings of getting robbed blind. Well, um, okay. That happens. There's, there's risk. Someone has to be the first mover in that transaction. And sometimes that's you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, tough position to be in. We we got really good at, at kind of our pitch for sellers and sellers would be the first mover, would sign before we'd pay. But it's a lot of hand-holding and, or, and or orchestrating the signings and all that jazz. But more importantly, outside of those two factors for a title company, you're subbing out that entire process, right? So for 1200 bucks for the insurance policy, for escrow, and for them doing all the legwork, that's amazing. And so then you can focus on the stuff that really drives value, which is not being a title abstractor. What drives value is, is acquisitions, market selection, mailing. So just focus on that stuff, right? And just kind of get the rest off your plate. I think the other thing with self-closings is in most cases, it means you're doing small deals, which okay. you know how I feel with small deals. I just don't think anyone should really be doing them for the most part. Um, and so, you know, if you're buying a thousand dollar property, it might not be enough margin to go the title route, but I think that kind of highlights a bigger problem. Why are we going after deals that are, are yeah. really not? to us um you know most folks that are building a land business well, like we have a lot of stats on this with the members inside the program it's like either high paying w2 or they run another business that they are trying to get out of could be a brick and mortar business could be e-commerce or we see a lot of people are running other real estate businesses that want to get into land kind of redirect their efforts and what that means is is there's a transitionary phase where they have to kind of phase out of whatever they're doing and so in that six to 12 month window where they're trying to go full time in the land business, they need a low impact, low friction business where they're not doing 25 deals a month. We're doing two to three deals a month where they're netting you know, 10, 15, 20 K a deal. That's way more meaningful. And there's just less moving parts in the business, right? If we go back to that concept of 30 to 50 steps per deal, dude, we used to do 25, 30 deals a month. There's so much going on. It's just out of control and you yeah. quickly hit a bandwidth issue. And then the question is what, well, okay we can bring on team members but then there's just not enough margin to really support that right that's that's the roadblock right. that we get so we built a big owner finance portfolio we're doing big volume but every deal we were selling yeah it would make us eight to twelve grand over five years or whatever it was right these are tiny right. deals the returns were crazy but every month there was 30 to 40k coming in and to support the marketing and the team and we were doing all the acquisitions because the deals weren't big enough to support joint venture partners. And I didn't know how to raise debt or anything at that point, which I think that's the only way to run that business at scale. So the first step is like, okay, let's go after deals that are meaningful that have enough margin to support using contractors like a title company or like a, a realtor. Now the process really from A to Z, we can talk about it more so when like when a lead comes in, right? The steps outside of that, pretty simple, right? You're going, you're finding markets that have demand, the correct sell-through rate, not too much supply. It's the kind of asset that you want to buy. You're marketing to it right you're taking a chunk in most cases where the pricing is homogenous so you actually have a fair shot to price it right a lot right. of cases we're pricing for like the median right we're just trying to be somewhat in the average somewhat realistic with the price we're going to mess up some of them but as long as most of the the data that's going out is well priced we're okay we right. still have to negotiate a ton of our deals but we got to get in the, the realm of being re like realistic so the person even wants to call us back so if right. we're too high, we're going to get so many calls that we have to renegotiate. This creates a ton of work in the business. But we're so low, it's just like crickets, right? And you got to send a lot of marketing to get any deal. So once a deal comes in, it hits Pat Live. That's our phone answering service. The deal, they, they go through our script. They put this, the uh, 
lead information into a form that gets added into our, our CRM. The leads in there, we have a rule that lead has to get touched within five minutes. So text and email immediately go out to confirm receipt. Hey, we've got your information. We're due diligence in the property. We're going to call you in whatever the time frame is. We try to get everyone on the horn in like 15 minutes. It rarely happens. It's probably closer to 30 minutes. There's okay. a lot of really interesting stats on inbound leads and time frames and the, the drop off rate that you see over time is like exponential for not calling them back within 15 minutes. And like if you go out, you, yeah. You all are really, um, you're seeing that much of a difference that, you know, if I respond and you don't call me within 15 minutes, that the response rate is dropping exponentially. Ton. Yeah. Wow. So I forget what the exact stat is um, kind of on the average for inbound leads. <laughs> I think it might be like a third or something like that. Wow. Uh, and then like if you go hours and days and weeks, it's like abysmal really quickly. And there's some yeah. land investors that are operating off of days, right, to call someone back. Yeah. If ever. Sometimes they just don't ever give you a call back. Um, like one of the biggest things that we combat in this business, okay, someone called our call center and we call them and we never get a hold of them. That's really tough. And so that's right. like that's a huge problem in this business. And we pay a lot for our leads, right? It's like a couple hundred bucks every time we get a lead. And so if we're not treating that lead like gold and getting on top of it really quickly, we're, we're missing out. So within that kind of 15 to call it maybe closer to 30 minutes in some cases, there's just only so much bandwidth our team can take on. And so some stuff does get pushed to the side. Um, so 30 minutes is kind of like the, the ceiling, right? Um, in that that 30 minute window, we're going through our due diligence process, which is on the front end is super duper simple. And we put a lot of like the heavy lifting on the plate of the title company. So we're going through the like the stuff that's going to kind of differentiate our offer. And then if we even want to buy the deal. So first we're looking at values, right? And we're looking at in terms of a range, just like a bracket. Okay. I think this is worth 50 to 60 grand. I'm going to try to make a 22.5 K offer to like a 30 K offer. I don't know, somewhere in that range. That's usually how we flex offers to owners is like in a range. And that's partially because I think a range is better for the, the seller. They're not going to hold you to one number, but also it gives us a margin for being wrong, right? Which, which we are in some cases. So we go through quickly, look at the comps. Our comping process starts with proximity. Then we're looking for features. So is it a similar featured property? Then we're looking for how recent was that for a sale? And there's some other factors in terms of like, was it an off market sale? Was it an on market? Like you can pick out some of the story from there, days on the market, stuff like that. But for the most part, like that's how we're kind of weighting comps because every comp is a little bit different, but really like the, the core of it, proximity means the most to me. We just reviewed a deal yesterday on the coaching call for one of the members and, you know, bless his heart. He thought he, he had a great deal. And if you, it was in a subdivision in Florida. So if you, he was buying it for 9k, I want to say, no, 12k. So you buy it for 12K, you thought you could sell it for 20K, which is already, in my book, too skinny. But if you zoomed out, it was in this big subdivision. If you zoomed out, there were comps to support that. Now, that doesn't really matter to me. A comp three miles away is way different than a comp on the same street. So if we zoom into the same street, there's a property that's for sale for 18K that's been up for 450 days. There's a property that sold at 7K a couple months ago. And there's like another one at 16 that's been up for like 150 days or something like that. And so that, to me, even though you could find justification by zooming out, that to me is enough to say, no, 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 we're not going to do yeah. that. Because I think that matters more than really anything else. Um, so we go through, do, do our kind of pricing analysis. Then we move over to some of like the material facts on the property. So access, do we have legal access? Okay, if we have legal access, what's the physical access like? That's a big deal breaker. It's not always perfect to figure out, but like, is it a paved road? Is it a county maintained road? Is it an HOA that maintains the road? Like, what's the story with the road? Are there other people that live on this, that drive on this? Then we look at the topography of the property. The two things that will ruin a good deal faster than anything else, and this is why the service that you're working on is, is important, in my opinion, is uh, legal, physical access and then topography. And the 3D right. maps that we use get you close, but not close enough, right? Then we're looking at do we are the person that we're speaking with, the lead that submitted the form, are they the same person that's on title? You'll see that there can be a disconnect there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> people that are family members trying to sell property that they don't own. Um, then we're looking at back taxes. Are there any liens that are obvious? There's some liens that are super hard to find. Like, is there an HOA lien or tax or something like that? Like, right. Just simple stuff. Um, and that's it, right? And then we're, oh, floodplains. So the last thing. I want to oh, yeah. You talked about access. Would you ever, or have you ever purchased a landlocked property? Funny that you should ask that. We just purchased a landlocked property today. So wow. yes, landlocked properties do have value. I've sold probably more landlocked properties than most people. Cause when I first got started, I didn't even know what access was. I yeah. was just buying anything that was cheap enough. Right. You can move landlocked properties, but there has to be such a price justification. Like we were buying properties that were worth 20 grand and selling them for four grand. 
and we're buying them for a grand, right? Like uh -huh. someone will buy them. It's crazy. I don't know why. Our strategy nowadays, though, is we don't really just flip landlock properties. We only buy landlock properties that we have a high likelihood of being able to, to actually provide legal access. So the deal that we bought is in Tennessee. It's 35 acres, about 30, it's almost 36, but 35.9 or something like that. Beautiful wooded lot, kind of like rolling topography. It's up on a hill, these beautiful 360 panoramic views. The owner has the adjacent property with a house on it that he lives in. So our caveat to him was, we'll buy the property, but you got to grant us access. So we're recording an easement. Solid. We're also using like a, a an option contract, kind of a double close strategy. So we've got, I think it's four or five months to perform. So we're getting the easement recorded. We can market the property in the interim, try to find a buyer and not have any cash in the deal. Um, and so we're buying, that's under contract at 60. We just listed it at 109. Properties with access trade for like 160. So we'll probably get an offer at 95, maybe 100, something like that. Um, so yes, we do buy them, but there's gotta be like a logical, like we can get an easement recorded kind of deal. Um, and I like doing those where we don't have much skin in the game. So an option contract is great, right? Give you some time to figure that out. Most cases it's pretty straightforward. It just depends. Uh, like I've done a few easements in the past with properties where like I own this is weird stories, but I literally owned the adjacent property by coincidence. <laughs> and so I just recorded the easement through that property to the property that was landlocked. Um, so yeah, there's actually so much value to unlock. It's a, it's a, a strategy within itself that you could go after. It's yeah. just going after landlocked properties. Because when we talk about value add like subdivisions and whatnot and entitlements, access is a huge value add because you can buy these for pennies on the dollar like truly oh, yeah. and it's not that difficult to get an easement you can call up all the adjacent properties if there are some that have road access offer the people 500 bucks some someone will take it in a lot of cases but i don't i don't want to go buy a sixty thousand dollar property before i know that there's access so you know we want to have some time to figure that out um so yeah we'll go through that kind of a, that initial due diligence call up the seller. We'll just have our initial chat with them. Sometimes we don't even flex an offer unless they're really hounding us for us for, for it. We're just kind of doing our fact finding on that call. Team adds all the call information into the notes of the CRM. Inside the CRM, all the due diligence they've done is listed out there. So all the comps they reviewed, the active comps, the sold comps, their information on the topography, the access, all of it's written in there. So myself or any other team member can quickly get a snapshot and say, okay, here's the property. All like the images for the property are in there. Like we want that all in one place, which is really easy to to just figure out what's going on with that property. Um, because like, I think a misnomer with having a team is that they do everything, that there's no management component. <laughs> there's still a lot of managing to make sure people are doing things correctly. So I got to go through, or Newman, our COO, has got to go through and review their work weekly to make sure that things are being done correctly. Um, my team, they have a rule, $50,000 and below, they can make an offer without approval. If it's above that, they have to run it by us. So they just run it by us in a, a Slack channel that we have. Hey, we're thinking about this as an offer. It's over 50K, they need approval. If they don't, they'll go make that offer. We try to do that on the second call, but sometimes that happens on the first call. Um, they'll send out the purchase agreement. Once the purchase agreement is signed, it'll get passed off to me. I still bless the deals that we buy. So I'll go through, give it a quick rundown, say yes or no, here's why. I think a lot of people have trepidation to put a deal under contract and getting it wrong. It's, it's okay. And I think that like we don't want to be in the business of canceling contracts on people. Um, I, I think it's bad business, but... Once we, if someone signed the contract and something comes up that we didn't previously anticipate, they're usually pretty bought into the transaction and you can go back to the drawing board if you have to. So I would rather have my team be pretty close to accurate and they, they usually are and get yeah. it under contract than not get it under contract, right? Um, we don't do any like memorandums or any stuff like that. Some people love doing that so that way no one else can come and outbid them. I just think uh, I'm not like one to litigate. So we just have the contract. <laughs> most times we'll send it to title immediately. So everything's going to go to a title company. In most places that we've worked, we usually work in a lot of the same places. So we'll have set title companies for every market that we work in. And that to me is like vertical integration, right? Finding the photographers in a market, the realtors, the title companies, that adds a lot of value to your process. Send it off to the title company. Once we get the title report, we'll go through that. And if everything checks out, there's no red flags, then we order the photos. Photos get done usually before we close. So we get like one last look on the property. If we get the, once we get the photos, the property is getting listed, right? So it gets listed on all the platforms, but the MLS, once it closes, it goes on the MLS. Now it's moved over to the dispositions team. Um, and they're filtering all the leads that come in from all the different platforms, kind of running them through their process. The disposition cycle in this business is like, it's very, very simple. Acquisitions, I think is more complex. Yeah. Dispositions is you're just answering questions for people, right? And we're not like strong arming people to buy these properties. The really only thing that we're doing that's salesy on the disposition side is just following up consistently. 
Um, but in most cases, we're going and getting information for people answering their questions and then letting them make a decision. Nowadays, a lot of our sales happen through the MLS. So usually there's a realtor representing the buyer and that takes some of the heavy lifting off of our plate. Um, send out the contract, get the contract signs, send it off to title, close it, wire out. Usually we'll have partners on the, on the deal. So we'll just kind of split the wire. And that's really it, right? Like there's some, there's some, obviously some micro stuff in between, but like really from a high level, those are like the big moving parts that we got to focus on. And then it's just kind of filling those gaps between employees and contractors. I think like the logical sequence is someone that's on the operations to start. It's a low level VA. It's like $5 an hour, Pat Live, acquisitions manager, and then eventually dispositions team. Um, any questions on that? No, I mean, I just got to say again, hats off to you. Um, I'm a big fan of systems and it, it yeah. really sounds like you guys have put together like a very well oiled machine. You know, yeah, you, you really, you know, where each piece is and, and what its function is. And I, I, you know, thank you, man. I appreciate that. It's been a long time, long time in the making. And I think the beautiful thing about the land business is that like, you can literally, I visualize a conveyor belt. And if you're buying similar assets, you just throw it on the conveyor belt. The process yeah. doesn't really change much. That's why I'm such a stickler. Like when people are doing like a little bit of self-closing, some infill lots, some real recreational, you don't, you can't really like make a uniform process for that. Yeah. Um, which I think at the end of the day, this is just a question of how many deals can we get in the door? How much money can we get to fund those deals? How many slots can we get to market them online? Like that's really the, the process. So the more streamlined we can make that the better. One thing to note too, is in the interim for every step, we use Trello boards to show where everything is kind okay. of within its stage, because yeah. it is really easy to lose sight of this stuff. Um, and then every team member is kind of responsible for their components. So one of the things that we've done that's been a game changer for us is running overseas teams or, or just virtual teams in general. Um, there can be like a lack of accountability because people aren't not like being watched over necessarily. So every single day, our COO runs a team meeting every day, same time. And we do our big weekly meeting every Wednesday. And what that allows us to do is every person comes to that call and it's like totally transparent on what they're working on. And then we hold them accountable to the outcomes that they said that they're working, working towards. Um, and that's been huge for us. I think a lot of people run overseas teams with, they don't treat it as if, they, this is why I hate the word VA. They treat them like VAs, not employees, right? Like in a business here in the US, you would, wouldn't have such a fragmented team that you don't connect with. And so it's been really big for us um, because you need a way to keep people accountable. But yeah, man, like the, the I always tell people like the business is super simple. That's not like necessarily easy per se, but the moving parts are simple. Um, I I know you've mentioned a team, so talk to me about what how your team structured currently. So at the moment, <laughs> I feel like I'm a team of one. Uh, yeah. To be completely transparent, I think I'm still at the stage in my investing journey where you know I've gone through those few lots and I've acquired some since then, but I'm still trying to figure out kind of what systems I want to put in place so that it's not such a hands-on kind of intensive process to, to move a single deal through from acquisition to disposition. So I, I think that's why I've been so interested in trying to get in, involved with your course and, yeah. and kind of build my business around what has worked in the past. Uh, one thing that I want to avoid doing is trying to reinvent the wheel, right? right. Because I feel like a lot of this information, right, a lot of these uh, experiences that you've gone through, you fed into the course. And so I'd like to kind of form it around that first. Yep. So, yep. I mean, my, my quote unquote team right now, at least in Michigan is just my title agent and, and my real estate agent. And that's about it. So I'm looking yep. to figure out kind of how, how do we scale this thing? Um, how do we repeat, um, you know, what happened last year into this year and grow it? Yeah. Yeah. One thing that I forgot to mention too, that I think is important when you're first starting out is like in the acquisitions, operations and dispositions, getting your hands dirty there. Like I, I know you used a realtor to start, but I would encourage your next one property or batch of properties, whatever the case may be, going through that process yourself, yeah. getting your hands dirty. I think like, yes, I think when you're first starting and you go through a program, like just emulate one-to-one -one, and then you can kind of iterate and add your own flavor to it eventually. We see people do that. Like they join the program first year or two, it's just like, I'm copying everything you're doing yeah. and then make some tweaks to it. Um, but there is something when it comes to building a team, there is something to be like, because a course is kind of in a vacuum. It's like static, everything looks really easy. And then you do it on your own. You're like, well, it's way more here than, than what I anticipated. And so it's hard to have something to measure your team against if you've never performed those tasks, right? Like 
you know, what does a good seller conversation look like? If you've never had a good seller conversation, you don't really have a benchmark to, to grade it against. So yeah. I usually tell people like the first three months of like going through the LEA program or any, any program, you are the guy doing everything. You are the one wearing all the hats and it's kind of a miserable existence for a little bit, but pretty quickly you can, you can scale out of that. Like it's three months of hardship and then it kind of snowballs over the next six months of actually building out a, I mean, you can quickly build out a full team within six months of this business. Um, so yeah, I think for where you're at, I mean, like the, just from the outside looking in, the tax auction stuff obviously wouldn't, wouldn't halt that by any means, but you've, you've come across some liquidity from those you know, 30 deals that you've sold thus far. I would pour some of that into marketing and start getting some seller leads coming in from direct mail and just get your hands dirty in that process. And mm -hmm. all it takes is doing one or two deals full cycle to be like, okay, I get it. And then build a team around that. Right. Yeah. And the next, the next step for you, honestly, because you, I mean, for what you're doing, it depends on how much marketing you're sending. You might just kind of skip and go straight to an acquisition manager. And for some people, like there's different recommendations. Um, an acquisition manager is like, it will drive the most value in your business for sure. Caveat is you got to be filling up a pipeline for them. So like there has to be a good amount of deals coming in. Um, now with the tax auction stuff, do you have any more deals in the hopper currently? Uh, in terms of like deals that I'm expecting to close? Yeah. On the acquisition side? Yeah. Um, right now, no. I mean, you know, they're the two or three that I picked up uh, since then, but it's yeah. really just been trying to offload um what i had in since october and um okay. you know trying to get this platform up has taken most of my time over yeah. the past few months um and i actually wanted to ask i mean you mentioned that you all get pictures uh i, I forget if you said it, it was before or after right before or right after it closed so it's it's actually we do it while we're still in closing but okay. we do it when we get the title report just so we know there's no oddities with the property where something has come up outside of our due diligence okay it's pretty simple so we'll go through that title commitment that we get and be like, okay this checks out and then immediately order them so we're still in closing but it's like halfway in and we're usually using a drone photographer which you know is costly like we just sent out a drone photographer for three properties today in colorado it's two grand it's like you know yeah and something could happen where we get the pictures back and we decide oh we're not going to buy one of these properties um, so it's costly the way, and we can, we can kind of transition over to what you're building. I think the way to use, use that is on the front end, right? Yeah. Because that's such a low cost. So just being like that is baking that into our due diligence, either before we go under contract, uh, before we even make an offer potentially, or once we're just sending it off to title from, from the start. So talk to me about what you've been building over the last few months. Yeah. I mean, Verity is really a product that's focused on the democratization of real estate investing, especially land investing, right? Um, every property that I've purchased to date has been sight unseen, including those three properties in Pittsburgh, right? I, I'd never set foot in Pittsburgh in my life, and, and I bought three houses out there. A lot of people would call that a bad idea, you know, yeah. just a risk. And I did the same thing with uh, the land that I bought out in Michigan, never seen it before, just, you know, drop some money on it and hope that there's nothing um, that is uh, going to prevent a sale. Now, obviously, you know, there are online tools available to perform due diligence. Um, you know, Google Maps at a very basic level, you can use a county site. Sometimes they'll have, um, you know, updated imagery, uh, if not for tax purposes. You know, the assessor will come around every year in some counties to take pictures. Um, you might be able to find old listings for the property and uh, get a sense of what, what it might have looked like a few years ago. Um, but really, I struggled to find a tool that would provide me a real-time sense of the asset that I was investing in, whether it's a property or a parcel of land. And so Verity is meant to help to fill that gap, right? If I'm an investor and I'm interested in a property, um, you know, I, I followed the steps that I just I listed out a few minutes ago. You know, I, I looked at the counties that I want to get involved in, and I have my list of properties. I have no idea what they look like. Verity is meant to step into that gap and allow me to get real-time imagery of those properties, right? I can order pictures, I can order a video, I can even get a live walkthrough or drone videos uh, or dro uh, drone photography of a property and decide, is this something that I'm willing to invest, you know, hard-earned capital into, or is it an opportunity that I'm going to pass up on? And I think part of the challenge of the solutions that are available at present is that they're just very costly, 
right? I mean, you're talking several hundred dollars to get drone photography for a single property, you know, and, and that can be a barrier to entry uh, for someone that is just starting out in this industry, uh, someone that's maybe a little hesitant, a little averse to risk, right? And, and they, this tool is meant to help to mitigate risk for investors and, and really uh, provide a sense of clarity. So that's what we're, we're trying to do. Um, I think there's also value for this on the back end in terms of marketing properties and getting images uh, that can help you to kind of list, uh, list your uh, properties on Zillow and on the MLS. Um, and I think if, if I had had this tool when I bought the properties in Michigan, I would have been much less likely to use an agent uh, yeah. just because, you know, I had no way of getting pictures of 35 lots in Michigan at a reasonable cost. So yep. I just hired somebody. Dude, so interesting. Talk about resourcefulness, man. Scratching your own itch. Yeah. I still am blown away at, at the price points you guys were talking about when you were putting this together. And one of the things that we'll include down below, it's still kind of in stealth mode, beta mode. It's not quite publicly available yet, but there's a bit of like a, a wait list folks can kind of get a part of for when it does come live. Um, something that we're going to be taking advantage of in our own business because, it, yeah, I mean, talk about 35 properties, the expense to get that done is, is ginormous, right? And slow, super slow. Oh, so yeah. many photographers, it takes us a dog's age before we get the photos back. Um, dude, I know we're running up on time here. Somehow we went 70 minutes, which was <laughs> it's pretty wild. Um, yeah, man. Any So first off, any parting words for folks? And then also, you know, if someone has questions about tax auctions, could they reach out to you? Can I put your contact information down below? Is that okay? Oh, for sure. I am all about connecting with folks and this community that you've built, man. I, I love it. I love the Discord chat. I'm always up for a conversation. Yeah. Hop on the phone with people. Um, I can, uh, do you want me to say my email address? And Yeah, you can stay here. I'm also included down below for folks. Yeah, sure. You guys can, you know, contact me by email, phone, text me first, please. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm available. Um, sure. I have a company email that uh, I can send to you, Sumner, and uh, my phone number. And hit me up. Uh, yeah, take advantage of that, guys. And one of the things, and you, you mentioned this in the beginning of the chat, but like, this is an interesting group of people, interesting niche. People are open, right? And that's a huge thing to take advantage of. There's some industries where there's gatekeepers and no one wants to talk to anyone. It's like very cutthroat. It's not the case here. So um, definitely recommend taking advantage of that. And that's how you and I got connected, right? You sent me yeah. a, a, an email and the, the ball got rolling from there. So um, we'll put all of that down below. And if there's anything that we can help with in the interim, obviously, you know where to find us to reach out and appreciate the time, man. It's been awesome. It's just been cool to connect, honestly, and hopefully the folks enjoyed this as well. And and, and understand, too, I talk about this all the time. Like Now, we, we have our own kind of set formula on how we do the land business, but the truth is there's so many ways to skin the cat and make money here. And you're, you're proof to that, right? Like you've taken a route that I had never even previously considered and, and have done really well there. So super exciting. Um, appreciate you being on, man. For anyone that's watched this, if you guys liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't like it, give it a thumbs down. That's totally okay. And subscribe if you guys want more land investing content. We'll see you guys soon. Bye. All right. I think we're good. Hey, that was awesome, man. That was. I appreciate you going the distance. I realize we took so much time. <laughs> that was great, man. That was good. That was really cool. So if you want to, I think I have your email. It's the uh, info at. Yeah, Nova uh, Consumption. Is that the one you wanted to use? 